Good morning, everybody. How are you? What a beautiful day. Thank you for making me a part of your day, and thank you, Jamie, for inviting me to participate. I just, this is a phenomenal series. I hope you're enjoying yourselves. I wish I had uh, decided to do the whole thing. Um, but it's a great opportunity, and I'm glad that you've been able to assemble so many good people and, um, and uh, you know, good, good ideas and good topics. I was, as Jamie was reviewing everything, of course, I was like writing my talk, listening to what she was saying, and, and you know, adding about 100 new things that I, I missed, and I probably won't get to, but anyway, I, um, I've never been to the University of Chicago. I, I do live right now in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, which is not a real hardship, but it's uh, really nice to be in Chicago, which I love, but I've never been to the university. I feel in the presence of a great divine spirit <coughs> and this beautiful building and all of you. And I think God took care of that dog one way or the other. <laughs> I have a feeling he's in a better place right now. Um, so I am going to, uh, well, first of all, I do want to say it's an, also an honor to be here with teachers. I love teachers. Some of my best friends are teachers. I think, I think it, one of my wives was even a teacher, as I recall. And uh, the, uh, I, so I'm going to actually dedicate today's talk to two of my favorite teachers. You don't know them, Mr. DeFalco, who was my fourth grade teacher, brilliant man. He sort of released my spirit in some way and Miss Pip, Mrs. Pip, my English teacher in senior year of uh, high school, uh, who just taught me how to write. So all of you, I'm, I'm grateful for, these, for those two people, all the teachers I've had, and so I'm, I'm honored to be among you. And um, what I'm going to do is try to provide you with a context of food security, hunger, food systems, I'm going to do kind of a historical review, you might say. Um, and I'm going to offer not two different perspectives, two different paradigms. Um, not so much as a critical comparison so much or, or uh, as a trying to organize a, a, anything that's controversial, but to simply show you that I think there are different ways of thinking about hunger and food security and food systems. And I don't know if, I, I imagine you've, in the course, in listening to this review, uh, that you have probably considered some of the issues, topics, and maybe have similar information from previous presenters. I hope I don't overlap too much. If you hear me going into something you've already discussed, please raise your hand, let me know, and I'll skip along. My, I have 40 years of experience working directly in communities for the most part. Most of my work was in the city of Hartford, Connecticut, where I ran a nonprofit organization for 25 years. People who don't know Hartford won't, may not know that it, at different times it's been one of the poorest cities in the country based on per capita income in a state which is actually one of the richest. So I worked in this very low income community for a long time. And I had the opportunity during, that, during my tenure as executive director to look at all kinds of issues and, and factors related to food and hunger and poverty and sort of the, the changes that were social and economic and cultural changes that were taking place in one place and how they influenced people's ability to be able to get food and live healthy lives but even how it influenced their ability just to live, quality of life. Uh, so that, that is my grounding foundation. You know, that, is my, that is my foundation. Uh, and it's also the experience from which I, I used, for the most part, to write my first book, Closing the Food Gap. And I've since gone on and done writing and communication, and now I do a lot of work on policy, on food policy. Um, mainly working with groups at a local and state level. I've actually worked with groups here in Chicago to do some, establish a food policy council. I have actually did a little work with a state group to establish an Illinois food policy council. So I've had the opportunity to interact a lot with people throughout Illinois. I should let you know as well that I'm, I'm part of my job and part of my life is to, is to continue to work, speak, train around community food issues, and if, if you're ever looking for any assistance of any kind, please feel free to be in touch with me. It's part of the reason I have my coordinates up here. 
So uh, enough of that, let's move ahead. And I have until 10.30, Jamie? Or did you tell me noon? I have until noon? 10.30, all right. So I wanna leave plenty of time for some, for, and also if during the course of my, my, uh, my uh, presentation, you got a really burning question, don't hesitate to put up your hand. If I don't see you, just yell out. But I do wanna, I definitely wanna reserve time for uh, discussion. So this is me, you've heard enough about me. I put my entire life in one slide. You know, isn't it wonderful that you can do that? You can, everything you've ever done that matters is all just in one slide and I think it's 32 point uh, type. I'm gonna take this discussion from what I, increasingly my, my, my view of a lot of problems we have in the world, but certainly food and hunger and health and of course, let's not forget all those connections to environment, economy, and so forth. I like to link it back to democracy. Um, perhaps because I'm in a divinity school here today, I have this sort of article of faith. The faith in this case is in democracy. And I use this um, quote from Amartya Sen, Nobel laureate economist, who after a lot of a lifetime of research on poverty, on world economies, um, political economies, f hunger, famine, and so forth, basically looked around and said, you know, if we have a functioning democracy, if people know what's going on, if governments are accountable, if there's transparency, if there's information moving around, we don't find hunger, at least on a significant scale, even when a country is very poor. And his sort of the most dramatic contrast that he uses is, is uh, communist China in between 1958 and 1961, one of the most authoritarian regimes on the planet in the 20th century, certainly, uh, had one of the, the biggest famine of the 20th century. 30 million people died. And it wasn't from lack of food. It was from lack of information. It was lack of government accountability. It was a lack of transparency. It was a lack of a free press that those people died. Now, it's not a direct line, of course, between democracy and freedom from hunger, uh, but it's where people get engaged, how we participate in trying to solve problems, and how we take responsibility for knowing what's going on. And I, having worked at a very local level where lack of information and disinformation and um, even attempts to undermine democracy are fairly common, um, I realize how powerful information and knowledge and citizen participation are. And of course, I like Kurt Vonnegut just because I like Kurt Vonnegut, who seems to kind of wrap it all up. Uh, food is really a big deal these days. Um, you, I'm sure you're, that's part of the reason you have this, this, this uh, meeting today, uh, this, this series. Uh, for me, it became really apparent how big a deal it was when uh, my mother, who's 85 years old, um, and she's not on the internet, she doesn't have a Facebook page, she, and she communicates with me with little handwritten notes on a, you know, once or twice a week, I'm getting these nice little notes that usually end with something like, Mark, why don't you write? And she started about a year ago sending me all these little news clippings about, uh, from, her, from her hometown newspaper in Virginia. And it was about a new farmer's market that had opened up or a new community garden or some new you know, food nutrition kind of program that was going on. So one day I said to her, mom, you know, what is this? Why are you sending me all these articles? And she said, for the very first time in my life, Mark, I understand what it is you do for a living. <laughs> so food is a big deal. All right, let's go right into, you know, this is what I regard as the food gaps f between you could almost look at America today, and I am gonna be mostly talking about the domestic scene. Uh, two, two ways to get food, the haves and the have-nots, if you wanna just simplify it. But we can see from, these are from USDA statistics, hunger and food insecurity, now 49 million people are affected in the United States. We have record participation in the food stamp program, now known as the SNAP program. Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Have you heard these numbers before? I mean, in the last two days? Okay, so the new stuff, good. Um, the SNAP program is now at a record level of expenditure as well, $80 billion. SNAP, you know, the, the food stamp program actually started in, in, the, 
in the, uh, in the almost the first day of John F. Kennedy's administration in 1961 and has been growing ever since. And um, it is one of our, by far, one of our largest social welfare programs at the same time. Um, another big food gap we see, of course, is overweight, obesity, and diet-related illnesses affecting 65% of the U.S. population, uh, according to the Center for Disease Control, where we're pretending, you know, the rise in obesity, and of course, in many following sometimes with diabetes and other diet-related illnesses, now threatens one-third of the American population as potentially being diabetic by the year 2050. Um, we have, in effect, a lack of food democracy and community control of the food supply. This is a point that I kind of harp on. You know, I want to be engaged in what is going on in my community when it comes to food. I want to participate. But I also want to go beyond that. I want to, I heard you mention GMOs, for instance. I don't want to get into a debate about GMOs, but you know, to what extent are we as citizens, are we actually food citizens? It's a topic you might consider playing around with, with your students, and not just food consumers. The food industry and most of the kind of our, even our a way of sort of politically thinking about our food system looks at us as consumers first. You know, they're little units of consumption. We're going to eat so much food, we're going to eat so many types of food. You know, we're all, we have zillions of bytes of data plugged into some massive computer spewing out all of our consumer history. And that's how we get all these little bits, little coupons and little come-ons and mar specially designed marketing uh, gizmos that are, you know, trying to entice us to buy the latest type of Frosted Flakes. Um, now, I know none of you are eating Frosted Flakes, I know, right? Absolutely not, but I bet they're trying to get you to do that. And all that kind of information is buzzing out there trying to get you, looking at you just as a consumer, not as a food citizen. So I think this concept of food citizenship whereby I can participate very directly, not just as, not just as someone who's going to go shopping once a week, but as somebody who might actually be able to exercise some control over the quality, the price, where my food comes from, uh, a number of attributes and characteristics that we're associating more and more with our food, even health. And as a, con as a consumer and as a food citizen, maybe I want to know what's in my food. Maybe it's okay that we label foods with, uh, as having GMO ingredients in them, if that's something you're concerned about. Uh, recently, the state of Vermont tried to pass a law that would require any food sold in Vermont to carry a label that it contained GMOs. Uh, Monsanto threatened to sue the state of Vermont, and the burden of that would have been so severe that Vermont backed down. You know, this is how I th think we're, we're seeing these questions of democracy and food citizenship play out, sometimes at a fairly extreme level. Um, we also have something called food deserts and food swamps. Have you discussed food deserts in previous? No? Okay, food deserts are places where, uh, I know you have many of them in Chicago, um, where there's simply a lack of access to affordable retail food stores. I know Danny Block is gonna be talking about that later on, so I'm not gonna dwell on it. But clearly we see more food deserts in lower income areas which raise questions of justice and equity. Uh, we also see a number of, of um, food deserts in rural communities as well. And according to the USDA, recent research, I think it's about two years old, uh, about 23 million Americans are affected by food deserts. They actually live in or near food deserts. So it's generally more difficult to get access to healthy uh, affordably priced food. And the second term, food swamps, meaning oftentimes what you see is the disappearance of supermarkets, supermarket abandonment, which I witnessed firsthand during my work in Hartford, um, being supplanted by all kinds of fast food places and convenience stores and mostly unhealthy food. So, you know, the existence of a food desert, almost like a vacuum that is created, now draws in uh, all these unhealthy sources of food, which in effect create a food swamp. 
Now, a little bit of history here, I think just to give you some kind of what I always think is sort of an interesting political context. Uh, one of our larger food assistance programs, school meal programs, which I imagine as teachers many of you are familiar with, um, was started by President Harry Truman in 1948. And he started it primarily because so many Americans, uh, young American men, were rejected for military service during World War II due to nutrition reasons. That was the main reason for rejection. So as a result, Truman decided to start the school lunch program. Now, he may have had very good intentions, but he was heavily influenced by that experience during World War II. What is the leading interest? And then we weren't talking about obesity back then. What is the leading cause now of rejection of military recruits? Well, as Mark Winnie says, it's obesity. Obesity is the leading cause now, currently in the military, for rejection of military recruits. I always say that I'm a big fan of world peace, but being too fat to fight is not the way to achieve it. So, and as I said earlier, uh, the, the food stamp program was created by an executive order by JFK in 1961. And he did it primarily to, um, as a response to a very poor political showing in the 1960 election uh, in farm states. So he said, well, if I can get this program in to help you know, poor people get food, at the same time, I can help farmers. I can help maybe incre increase the price of, of uh, commodities, or I can reduce the surpluses that were fairly common back then. And so he looked at a way that he could link the, f the, the improvements in the farm economy food prices, and the uh, needs of lower income people, uh, and also help himself politically. If you want to investigate this subject more, I would, or actually going even back further, I would definitely recommend the book Breadlines by John, Jan Poppendike. She's also written a couple of other books, uh, Sweet Charity and uh, Free for All. Free for All is about the school meal program, school, school lunch, school meal program. Uh, and Sweet Charity is about kind of the history and the evolution of food banks. She really is, in my opinion, one of the best writers out there on our kind of food systems and policy. And then, um, you know, so I, I, I put those in there, I put those in there sort of give you a little bit of that historical context that it's interesting that the way that we the way that we have thought about food and hunger in this country is not so much out of some you know, desire to do good, to be fair, and to be just to everybody. Often it's a case of how we link it to national defense, how we link it to agricultural concerns, or how we link it to, um, um, uh, you know, the, or the, the politics of the moment. So, you know, we're always sort of piggybacking, you might say, these kind, you know, the need to try to help people have an adequate diet with how we address other needs. Now, politically, that's often necessary. The big argument or the, the statement that's always made, and there certainly was truth to it earlier, I'm not as sure today, but it's about the link between the food stamp program, as I said, now it's an $80 billion a year program, and agriculture. We've always got agriculture to stand up and support the food stamp program when it comes up for reauthorization every five years in the Farm Bill, and um, the uh, uh, and then sort of the the you know I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back. Argument is that then the you know the uh, food stamp advocates and hunger advocates will come forward and support um, subsidies, price subsidies for farmers. So that's kind of the quid pro quo that continues to go on. Not as much today as in the past, but certainly as part of our history. As Jan Poppendike has outlined in Breadlines, she tells the story of how we had, you know, we had, you know, hunger all over the place in during the Great Depression. Farm prices had dropped. There were actually surpluses of food, uh, but there were hungry people. So the government under Roosevelt intervenes and tries to get more of that surplus food directed to low-income people, also helping to try to, you know, raise prices a little bit at the same time for farmers. And that was working okay for a while, but the agricultural community got wind or began to sense that this kind of government intervention is going to sort of take away the consumer's 
buying power. I mean, the, the consumer is not going to want to buy food on their own because they can get free food. So they advocated to actually reduce the giveaway program during that period. In effect, kind of create, keeping a certain degree of hunger, a higher level of hunger than would have existed otherwise. Um, <clears throat> One of my, one of, a couple of sort of seminal books, if you want to get, go deeper into some of the history, uh, Food for People, Not for Profit, and I think one of the, probably one of the all-time favorites, Diet for a Small Planet by uh, France, Frankie Moore LaPay, uh, are two books that influenced really a whole generation of people, including myself. Um, and I, in my book, Closing the Food Gap, and I should mention also that I have a few copies of Closing the Food Gap with me, and I'd be happy to... Uh, to uh, sign, I'm happy to sell them to you for 10 bucks. Here it is, also happy to sign it. But um, I just wanted to read one little passage here, again, for historical purposes, um, that this stuff we're talking about today isn't so new. It's been out there for quite a while. Food for People, Not for Profit was published in 1975 gave us one of the first overviews of the U.S. food system's many gaps. The book came out as a complement to the first World Food Day in 1975. It was also hot on the heels of the Russian wheat deal, which had seriously reduced domestic supplies of U.S. wheat in the nation's first serious energy price spike, both of which drove up food prices to never before seen heights. Food for People slammed corporate agribusiness and its bedfellow government. Its enumeration of our health and diet sins was prescient in light of today's obesity epidemic. It, it, it included a 1974, 1974 article from the New York Times Magazine noting that the major nutritional affliction in the United States is obesity. It's 1974. I was rather shocked when I saw that. A stunning remark considering that obesity levels then were absolutely wimpy in comparison to those today. The authors accused food, major food corporations such as Coca-Cola and Kellogg of promoting eating habits that squander limited food and economic resources and degrade already inadequate diets. They went on to say that the American food crisis is also reflected in the prevalence of diet-related illnesses, beginning with dental decay and often ending with a cardiovascular coup de grace. And then I think one, of the, one passage that I found particularly moving was that in 1970, uh, the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Need, again, remember 1970, um, brought in two U.S. Army captains, Terrence Coggin and Clifford Hendricks. They were, they were brought in to uh, review food programs that were going on and hunger in the U.S. It was interesting that they would bring in two military officers for that purpose. But the two West Point officers had been ordered to survey federal food programs to see if the hungry were being fed. After visiting 15 counties in five states, Captain Coggan testified before Congress, I was emotionally stunned in going from household to household, seeing children staring at walls because they weren't getting food. I was stunned by the experience of going off in a car to a shack where children, in my opinion, were literally dying. Their minds were dying. You know, that's from an army officer in 1970. And I think what is, to me, a seminal moment in how we began to think about food differently and think about the relation to nutrition and not just getting enough calories to eat, and it's an important difference. Are we getting just enough calories, which had been more or less our approach to hunger for a long time, or are we looking at the quality? Are we looking at the link between health and food and health and agriculture? We hadn't really made those links until this point in 1974, when the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition, that was co-chaired at that time by Senators George McGovern and Robert Dole, a bipartisan team who continue to work to end hunger and poor nutrition. The report stated that the fundamental issue facing the hungry is not so much the mechanics of food assistance programs as it is the fact of persistent poverty and the continued tolerance in this country of a starkly inequitable distribution of income. 
In a nation in which 40 million people remain poor or near poor, more than a food stamp or child feeding program is at issue. 1974. I had the opportunity once to, to uh, meet uh, Senator McGovern, and I told him, I thought, I thought you know, that report was the most important thing uh, in terms of my history, my career uh, as a food uh, activist. And he said it was also, for him, it was the most important p political moment in his career, which I thought was rather remarkable. I don't think he was just trying to like play up to me or anything. I think he was actually, I think he was, I think he really meant it. So again, go back, think back, you know, that's how, what is that, 30, almost 40 years. Uh, and that's in a way our, our thinking hasn't evolved too much more than it has than, than at that point. So let's take, a, let's take a look at the current situation. Here's our, this is what's happening today. So we looked a little bit at that history, some of the political context. You know, think about that, the, those economic disparities. Interesting to say in 1974, we have these huge economic income disparities, wealth disparities. They're much bigger today than they were then. So today, uh, we measure f hunger or food insecurity, and more recently, very low food security, um, which used to be known as hunger, uh, based on a, the annual current population census. Uh, these are, this, this, is, this census is asked of 50,000 people. Uh, the questions are asked of 50,000 people. 18 questions were devised by the U.S. Department of Agriculture back in the mid-1990s. I actually was participated in a little bit of that design work. I think I, ha I, think I contributed maybe a preposition or two. I'm not sure I did much more. But if you look closely at the questions, you might see something you're from me. Anyway, it was you know, an interesting process to come up with these questions as a way to try to determine the level of hunger and food insecurity in the United States. And it was the first you know, significant attempt uh, by the government to do that kind of measurement. Um, today in the U.S., and I should say that we, we lag quite a bit behind. These, these questions are asked in December of every year. And um, right now, they're being, they're, I mean, we'll, the data we get, we'll get for this coming fall, when these, when these numbers are usually released, will actually be from December of 2011. So we're kind of lagging behind a good year. But from the most recent numbers are 14.5% of the nation as a whole is food insecure. 9% uh, is, is, is low food security, but very low food security is 5.4%. Um, now go just skip down two bullets and you see that in December of 2000, the total number of food insecure was only was 10%, I should say not only, but 10%, and 3% were very low food security. So we've seen a fairly significant increase in 10 years uh, in those numbers. If you look at, if you, go to, if you go to the website down at the bottom, it's actually really interesting. I don't know if anyone's explored it, but you know, there's a lot of information about food security and insecurity. There's a lot of information on measurements and data and the, and the methods that they use to gather the, the, da the data every year. And there's also state rankings. And that's not really a ranking, but there's, you see the numbers by state. Just, I just put in Illinois to give you some idea since that's where I am. Uh, I'm from New Mexico. We traditionally have high uh, food insecurity rates, 15, 16 percent. Mississippi tends to be the worst almost every year, 19.4 percent. If you see a relationship between hunger, food insecurity, and poverty, it's not just coincidental. It's very much what the story is. It's very much about poverty. And the thing that I think one of the more striking aspects of this, and you have to kind of dig into the USDA data to find it, is the number of children who live in very low food security households, almost a million. The last time I looked at that number, which was about two or three years ago, that number was somewhere between six and 700,000. So that's, there's been close to a 50% increase in uh, very low food security uh, children in the US. So what have we been doing about this? What, how do we respond? Well, I think it's been kind of a mixed bag. Um, different approaches, again, sometimes, a lot of times, politically motivated. Um, uh, sometimes we have good intentions. Um, sometimes the good intentions go awry. 
Uh, but I would say the one thing that characterizes our efforts in this country to end hunger and food insecurity is an abysmal lack of coordination. We have not worked together uh, consistently. Uh, we have not looked at the systemic causes of food insecurity and hunger. Um, we basically kind of organize a response often you know, either we're driven by our own passions or we're driven by sort of a political expediency, and we end up with sort of a, a very fragmented approach to addressing these programs. Best evidence I have for this is that we have actually have 15 separate USDA food and food nutrition programs, food and nutrition programs, it should say. You know, SNAP is by far the largest. School Meals is, I think, the second largest. Uh, the Women, Infant, and Children program is the third largest. Uh, and then we have a dozen or so more uh, programs, all of which have kind of evolved, both were developed and have expanded over the years due to the interest of particular individuals, advocacy organizations, um, and politicians. And again, not in any coordinated fashion. And I, I emphasize the point that I, in spite of what the Senate Select Committee had said back in 1974, we still place most of our emphasis. It's, it's certainly a poverty management approach. We're looking at food relief, but we're also looking at calories over nutrition. You know, that is still where the debate is. We're still saying, all right, just enough food. I had this, where did I, I had this discussion just a day or two ago with somebody I ran into who's involved with a food bank. And they say, gosh, you know, I'm, they're, they're volunteering and, they're, and you know, the demand at the food bank keeps growing and growing and growing. And this person was really, really un, very frustrated with the quality of the food that was being distributed at the food bank. They just felt that it was not good, it was not healthy. Very little fresh fruits and vegetables. And most of the fresh fruits and vegetables they, that they were seeing and coming in and distributing were just like a day or two away from being tossed into the compost pile. So, there is you know, still that argument very much in play that food relief, you know, whatever we got to do, whatever kind of food we have available, and um, not focusing so much on health and nutrition, even though people care about it, you know, they're, they're dealing with sort of immediate realities of a line of people at their food pantry door. How do they deal with that? How do they respond right away? <clears throat> so you know, that's been some of the tension. Um, I go back to my days in, in Hartford, Connecticut. I, in 1980, I organized a food bank, became one of, our, one of the New England region's largest food banks. Um, <clears throat> at that time in the country, there were no food banks. Important historical point. There were no food banks in America prior to, I think it was prior to 1980, maybe 1979. There were very few emergency uh, food programs like soup kitchens and food pantries. Uh, most of them were of the sort of traditional nature like the Salvation Army, uh, the old settlement houses that date back to the 19th century, a few church soup kitchens here and there, um, <clears throat> really uh, no more than a few thousand. And, and then today there's 60,000. Yes? Would you differentiate between the food bank and the food bank? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I should have done that. Uh, a food bank is a really a large warehouse operation that serves a, a region. Um, what is it, the Chicago Depository? Is that the big food? What's that? Yeah, that is a food bank, big, and it serves, and it will typically serve hundreds, in this case, probably thousands of smaller sites that are called food pantries. Some places they're called food cupboards. Uh, they kind of, there's variations on these themes, but that's basically what they are. <clears throat> okay. um, so, partly to sell books, but partly to raise an issue that I felt really, really strongly about. I wrote an essay that, um, for the, uh, the opinion uh, section of, this, of the Sunday Washington Post back in 2007. And I really kind of took the food banking world to task. I said, you know, you guys just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The lines keep growing, growing, and growing. The problem doesn't seem to be going away. Um, and yet, and you, and you are able to mobilize thousands of people. The number of people involved as volunteers, or as staff, or as board members in food banks and food pantries is astounding. It's millions of people across the country. 
I said, why can't you mobilize all these people to take on the root causes of hunger? Why can't you, like, if you, if you could put all the, I, I use the analogy of taking all the people who were associated with um, food banks just in New England, five or six or seven food banks, if they took all their volunteers and all their staff and put them on buses, uh, they, would ha they would have a line of buses going from, from uh, New England to Washington, D.C. that would probably be about 10 miles long. And that would have an enormous impact on the politicians. They don't do that. They don't take on the political problems. They don't get to the underlying causes. Well, I made two mistakes with this article. One was that I had it published at the very top of the page, above the fold, dramatic graphics, uh, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And the second was I put in my email address at the end of the page. I got buried. I got buried. It was an avalanche. Interestingly enough, I would say, two F, I had my son hanging out with me for a few days over Thanksgiving, and I had him count my email messages and see how many were pro, how many were con, or, and he's, about two-thirds of them were in favor of the argument that I had made that we need to, that food banks need to take on the root causes of hunger. They can't keep just getting bigger. They have to get to the source of the problem. Um, <clears throat> so, but, you know, it didn't necessarily resolve the problem that I was like completely overwhelmed for a long time and I made many enemies out there. Um, but here's the, here's this, let me ask you this question. <clears throat> Of all the food that is distributed, uh, free or you know, basically free food that you would get, either food that you're getting with, with assistance from SNAP benefits or WIC or school meals, or food that you're getting from food banks, food pantries, all those sort of nonprofit, non-government sources. Anybody have an idea what the ratio is? How much of it is so-called, you know, of that free food is public sourced, you might say? how much of it is privately sourced. Anybody want to, you know, a ratio, of, you know, a percentage? Anybody want to take a guess? Yeah? 70% uh, corporate, 30% government. 70% corporate, meaning private? Like Kellogg would donate uh, an excess amount. Well, including food, are you including food banks and so forth? I thought that was a question. Like, Greater Chicago Repository, where do they get their donations? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, but, but if I'm a, cons if I'm a, a hungry person, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm either, I can go to a public source like food stamps or I can go to a food bank. You know, what's the relative dif difference? That's what I'm, so you're saying kind of 70, 30, private, 30% public? I thought you were asking where does the food bank get its food? No, not where the food bank gets its food. I'm sorry. Of all that free food, whether I can get it using government benefits or I can go to a food bank, what is the percentage? Yes? Ninety-five percent what? Ninety percent is public. Anybody else have a different? It's a private facility. It's a private nonprofit organization. Okay. Anyone else guess? Well, you're right. That's that's about ninety to ninety-five percent public. However, when I asked that question, you are, you're all teachers, so you're much smarter than the average person. But when I asked that question elsewhere. Like if I, I, if I go to the Rotary Club or I speak at a, you know, a, a church a gathering, people will inevitably do it the opposite. They'll say 80 to 90 percent is private, private food coming from food banks, et cetera, and the, the balance, 20 to 10, maybe 30 percent, is coming from public sources. So that gives you some idea of how the American public begins to look at the relationship between food that's coming from government, from where we act as citizens, where we act as sort of public and um, food citizens and taxpayers, and how we act for, as a sort of charitable response to food issues in our community. Now, the other part of this that I think absolutely has to be understood and has to be understood in the context of you know, the wealth disparities that we have in this country and how our economy is continually getting dumbed down is that we now are definitely in a low wage economy <clears throat> um, where you know people are getting paid much less lower wages uh, high unemployment rates and overall poverty contributing to sort of this in a way a demand for high calorie cheap food the success of Walmart uh, for instance is not 
just because they got a great business model, which I would argue with, but that they have cheap food and they are actually paying people wages that sort of allow, that almost require that they shop at Walmart to get cheap food. Best example I have of this is uh, an interview I did with a food bank director in a county just south of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I was interviewing him about the growing demand for food stamps at that time. And he said, yeah, it's been amazing. I've been seeing this incredible increase in demand. And, and he was perplexed by this because the unemployment rate in that county was somewhere between one and 2%. One and two percent, so how can you have such a high demand then for food stamps? I said, well, the two largest employers in my county are large Walmart super centers. And the wages in those places are so low that most of their employees are eligible for food stamps. Raised in my mind the question of why taxpayers are indirectly supporting America's largest retailer. Also, we'll note that of, of the 33, I don't have this slide up there, but of the 33, um, most developed nations in the world, the U.S. actually has the highest food insecurity rate. It has some of the worst performing students uh, in the world. Uh, it has, some, it has uh, one of the lowest, uh, uh, one of the worst mortality rates, and we, we pay more for health care than any other nation. And, believe it or not, no surprise, of those 33 nations, the wealth disparity in the United States is the greatest among those 33. So we look at a take another tack here. We look at, all right, so we, we've, we've approached the problem of how do we address hunger? How do we even understand hunger? How do we talk about hunger from a sort of a position of calories, of, of food relief, of sort of political expediency and so forth, this sort of mishmash of a sort of evolution of programs over many years. This is where I've been doing my work, and so I obviously have a bias, I'll admit that right up front, but this idea of community food security, which is one where we look more closely at our own community. We don't just look at the adequacy of the, you know, the, of the resources in terms of, say, the food stamp program or a food bank. We look at how, we look at the entire food system. We look at where food is coming from. We look at what the economic impact is of our food system um, on people. Uh, we look at the questions of sustainability. Is our food system sustainable? If we lose all of our farmland, if people aren't producing food in our region, how can we consider ourselves to be food secure? You know, we, in other words, we're kind of refocusing the whole question of food security and hunger. Um, in a more localized or more regionalized way, as opposed to, say, someone who's looking at the problem nationally and says, well, the best way to solve our problem is to, is to increase funding for the food stamp program and to increase the size of our food banks. And just take that national perspective. Food security, in that sense, is being looked at at an individual household level. Community food security is looking at it from a community perspective. Do I have the resources, the skills, sort of the organizational capacity to provide for a greater share of our food and meet the needs of everyone uh, equitably? So these are just some of the principles. Again, it's, you know, we're looking at the impact on the economy. It's multi, community food security is multi-sectoral, meaning that we're in trying to engage all the elements of our food system. Everybody, including the food stamp directors, including the food banks, but urban agriculture, farmers markets, uh, food and nutrition programs, teaching kids how to grow food, how to prepare food. This is all part of the community food security movement. Just give me one moment. I should say that uh, under the question of economy, I think it would, I've always, I'm always fascinated when I see some of the numbers about what are the size of our food economy. In most cases, um, you, the food economy is actually the second largest economic sector. If you take all the jobs from, uh, from farm workers to bus boys and bus girls, take all that kind of combined economic impact, Food is usually the second largest sector. 
Um, if you ever want, if you want to look at some uh, good work on this, some analysis, a guy named Ken Meter, M-E-T-E-R, is a good source. Um, his firm is called Crossroads. I think it's called Crossroads Consulting. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have the website, but um, he does these kind of economic food uh, analyses for communities, states, regions, and a good source of data on sort of understanding our food economy. Uh, I like to think of community food security as having three Ps, projects, partnerships, and policies. Um, projects are all these things that are kind of going on all over the country, all over the, you know, many, many every community I, I go to now, I find this, all this, uh, um, all this interest and enthusiasm around locally produced food, uh, around gardening, urban gardening, community gardening. Just one example, farmer's markets has gone from 1,700 in 1994 to 7,100 today. Uh, we're here, there's all kinds of interests and ways of trying to bring retail food back into food deserts. Uh, community food hubs are kind of a more organized and almost, kind of almost a for-profit, non-profit, uh, hybrid way of organizing food resources in a given community. Uh, we're looking more at local food enterprises. And a central part of this, of this work is around building community. So it, the idea here is that if we build our community, sort of a takeoff, you might say, on the question of democracy, on food democracy. If our community is strong, we're more likely to be able to meet more of our food needs. I, one of my favorite quotes from one of my mentors back in Hartford was that the most important word in community gardening is not gardening. It's about the community's investment in that particular project. And when that investment is strong, you're likely to see very positive outcomes. So that is a really central piece, as you might imagine, from the idea of community food security. Partnerships are uh, that sort of you know, building, not that this work is no longer done as sort of an individual program or as a highly institutionalized response to a need. It's a much more collaborative, community-based kind of process. It does integrate federal food programs and food banks, but those programs that in and of themselves don't necessarily empower people. And we are very interested in empowering others to meet more of their own needs, to help themselves, to be engaged in the process of building the strength of their communities themselves and not always relying on outside sources to do that. Now, the third P is policies. How do we engage local and state government to influence the supply, quality, et cetera, of food? Public policy, you know, whether you're talking at the local level where a zoning official can make a decision about whether or not to allow a vacant lot to be turned into a community garden, to a state level where um, government can decide to invest a little bit more money in the um, uh, school meal program, to the federal level where the farm bill is now being debated in Congress. You know, this is public policy in many, many dimensions. And it's kind of the area where I've been spending more of my time over the last few years. But I'll give you just one really kind of quick example of how I think this project partnership and policy um, <clears throat> uh, uh, description actually works. When I was organizing farmers markets in Hartford, Connecticut in the 1980s, my interest was in helping farmers, but I was more interested in helping people who lived in low-income neighborhoods where there were no supermarkets and who had lack, serious lack of access to healthy food. I could do a pretty good job of getting those farmers markets started, but suddenly farmers markets became really popular all over the country. And in fact, in the very affluent suburbs around Hartford, um, they became so popular that the farmers markets were drawing the farmers away from the markets that I had organized in the city. And I couldn't really compensate for this sort of highly affluent population that was willing to pay $4 a pound for tomatoes. So I looked to a public policy approach as a way to try to resolve this issue. And I went to, I tell this story in, in my book, Closing the Food Gap, how I went and met with the uh, Department of Agriculture for the state of Connecticut and later the Department of Health. And we came up with a, what is now called the Farmer's Market Nutrition Program. 
Now this program, is demonst the demonstration for this was actually a year before that in Massachusetts. But the idea was that we would get funding from state government to provide coupons to low-income moms in the WIC program that could only be used to buy fresh fruits and vegetables at farmers markets. This was 1986. This later became a full-fledged state program, then it became a full-fledged uh, federal program. And there's been variations on this theme ever since um, of how we try to make these connections between building a local food economy, addressing health, nutrition needs, and at the same time, you know, providing you know, more resources to low-income people so they can help themselves. So you know, that was sort of the model, you might say, of how we began to do that, how we began to integrate different aspects of our food system. But policy was a key part of that, working at a state level in this case. We can see this in other forms, too. Uh, in New Haven, Connecticut, they did not have a supermarket. Um, we had a state food policy council. It went, to the, it went to this Connecticut Economic Development Commissioner. We asked, the, we asked the commissioner at that time if he had ever invested in any kind of food enterprise in the state of Connecticut. He got out his uh, little computer and he was looking at all his stuff and kind of playing around the keyboard. He said, no, we haven't. We've never done that. And he paused for a minute and he said, no one has ever asked. So we asked. And we got a million dollars for a new supermarket that was, uh, was one, a million out of, I think, seven or eight million required to develop a chain supermarket in the lowest income neighborhood of New Haven. But in this case, the big partner was a nonprofit um, uh, development, community development corporation. One of the best examples of policy and, and how we can drive the economy is the Fresh Food Financing Initiative which looked at the health disparities in low-income areas of Philadelphia and found that they were greatest in areas with the fewest supermarkets. And they began an investment program at the state level uh, that ultimately resulted and has resulted so far in the development of 85 new supermarkets throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. I'm not going to describe all these, but these are ways that we've been able to engage people, engage people at the community level, and try to solve serious disparities, discrepancies in our, their food system, and use public policy at the same time. Um, I'll just note under public transportation, when sometimes you gotta, if you can't get the food to the people, you have to get the uh, people to the food. And what we were able to do in Hartford was to, through a lot of research, research and community food assessment work, we were able to determine that our bus routes, our public bus routes, were not going to supermarkets. And uh, we were able to basically, um, through a lot of, and this was actually a research project involved um, uh, college students at that time. Uh, they did most of the research for us to find out that people riding our buses were, 25% of them were riding them to get to a supermarket. But the buses really didn't, didn't go there. They didn't go there easily. So we were able to make changes in the bus routes as a result of that. Um, other examples of where we're bringing together, uh, you know, food justice and and um, <clears throat> you know, developing the local food system at the same time. I'll just note this last one: food and cooking education. In, you may come across it in uh, my book, Food Rebels, where I tell a story about a really wonderful project in Austin, Texas, called the Happy Kitchen. It's a program of the Sustainable Food Center, which in my opinion is one of the better nonprofit food organizations in the country. And the Happy Kitchen is kind of a peer-led food education, nutrition, cooking program designed to reach mostly uh, single moms, lower income, increasing their ability to prepare healthy meals themselves, for, for themselves and for their families. And um, very successful program. It's not big enough. None of these programs are to have the desired big impact, but it's a really good model of how we can integrate uh, food education and cooking education into a whole plan to improve the uh, quality of a local food system. Um, <clears throat> another area of growth is something we call food policy councils. This is where we're putting policy to work at a local and state level and bringing together many different sectors of our food system. I've been engaged in starting many food policy councils over the years. Uh, we see, if you look at the bottom, a fairly significant growth 
just in the last <clears throat> two years from 111 to 193. Uh, they're, they're working to try to coordinate all the efforts of local food system players, actually have a table where people can sit down together with different food interests, both public sector and private sector, for-profit and non-profit, and work together to try to come up with a common design for a better food system. That's really what the idea of these food policy councils are. And there are many food policy councils, I should note, that are now engaging young people. There's, there's actually, some, in some cases, separate youth food policy councils in a few uh, cities around, the, in, around North America. So it's another way for young people to say, hmm, policy, I think I see how that can play out right here in my own backyard. And I can link it to the needs as I understand them in this community and also the kind of projects and programs that I may be involved with. If I'm interested in gardening and I have policies and regulations on the books in my city that prohibit gardening in a particular place, how can I get those changed? And they can be changed. So that's, that's part of what a food policy council does. Um, I'm not gonna, you can look at these later. These are just some examples of some of the areas where they've been effective. In, I, I like this example from uh, Cleveland because it's very comprehensive. Their Food Policy Council did change zoning to promote urban agriculture and the raising of chickens and bees. And, and that's been a big topic of interest uh, in urban areas. How do we allow for the raising of poultry and bees? <clears throat> in some cases, other animals too, like goats. So that's been kind of an <clears throat> uh, interesting direction. Um, <clears throat> they've also in, taken their economic development money. This is ideas being generated by the Food Policy Council uh, and direct them toward economic development around food. And then they've taken their purchasing power. You know, every city, every state has millions, tens of millions of dollars of, of public dollars to buy food for schools, hospitals, prisons, and so forth. How can we use some of that money to improve our food system, to, to support local agriculture or local farming, local, local gardening? <clears throat> And that's what Cleveland and many other cities are doing now. And they also have um, <clears throat> something they've just launched called Healthy Cleveland, where they're, you know, just how do we improve the overall health of this community? And food is a big part of that. And their physical landscape and the built, la the built uh, uh, landscape is part of that uh, discussion as well. I don't have enough time to talk about trans fats. It's sort of the bad news side. Oh, maybe I'll tell you the story. What they did, they tried to ban, you know what trans fats are? You know, New York City banned trans fats a few years ago. Cleveland tried to ban trans fats as part of this Healthy Cleveland initiative just about a year ago. <clears throat> and this kind of shows you the other side, that the dark side of the food system. And um, the, the Cleveland, not the Cleveland, the, the Ohio uh, Restaurant Association found out that Cleveland wanted to ban trans fats, and that was upsetting to them. So they went to the state, the state legislature, and on the last day of the last of the most recent session, um, <clears throat> they were able to introduce a bill uh, that was tacked on to the state budget request um, and supported by uh, their governor at that time, uh, the governor is currently still a governor, to, pre to preempt any action by a community from, from uh, anything regarding you know, banning trans fats or ma making any other changes in the nutritional content of food. So the right of the city was taken away by the um, <clears throat> state of Ohio. Now this was a very political move, one based on the power of that industry to you know, control how the kind of food that it was serving. Set up a real sort of political battle that has not yet been resolved. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go. I know you want to hear something about the farm bill, so I'm going to go right to this. You know where <clears throat> the farm bill. It's reauth. This is our going leaping ahead to our federal policy, national policy level. It's reauthorized about every five years. Sometimes it slips into six or seven. Um, it's under debate right now. The Senate has just passed uh, a version of this. The Senate being controlled by the Democrats has a somewhat more liberal version. Uh, when it goes to the House, it's gonna definitely end up being a lot of the, the good changes that were made uh, by the Senate are probably gonna be cut. I don't know how it's all gonna resolve itself. But the Farm Bill is where we take on everything about, just about everything about our food system, 
food, we, you know, we should, many people want to call it the food bill, but in fact, you know, that keeps getting pushed back by the farm interests. Go back to the 30s, go back to the 40s, go back to the 60s. You see how strong our agricultural interests, I don't have to tell you that, you're in Illinois. You know how important those things, the corn and soybean crowd are. And um, you know, that still is what directs a lot of our, our effort there. Yet, even in spite of that, the SNAP program is still the biggest piece of the uh, farm bill. But it's also a place where we try to introduce little innovations. It's a place where we try to come up with some creative way of tweaking our food system. And over the last 10 to 15 years, we've come up with ways of promoting better health, you know, bringing together farmers markets and low income communities, making it easier for people to use their SNAP benefits at uh, farmers markets. Um, a lot of, and they're all, when I say small, they're usually $5 million, $10 million a year, sometimes $20 million a year in comparison to 80 billion for food stamps or tens of billions of dollars for commodity uh, uh, subsidies, um, it's pretty small potatoes. But it is a way that we've been able to make some changes. So the current status, this is the Senate bill, uh, almost a trillion dollars over 10 years. So you gotta divide that by 10. Um, <clears throat> we're seeing 750 billion for SNAP. Um, this is a four and a half billion dollar cut, uh, which would reduce benefits for about half a million people as a result. This is the games that are played. You know, I'll, we'll cut the food stamps if you cut a little bit of the commodity program. So that's how we're doing it. Yet we're trying through this in the second bullet, just a list of programs that are trying to bring back healthier food, more local food, uh, really address some of the underlying health issues, obesity and so forth, that are you know, plaguing our, our food system. And that's it. I'm going to leave it there. That's all I know. And thank you very much. A couple minutes for questions. You mentioned the prevalence of these food gaps in, in the United States. I'm wondering if you see any correlation between geography or uh, political inclination of a state maybe, um, and how that affects the uh, hunger and food insecurity in, in, uh, in that region. In terms of geography, I mean, you're, 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 you know, these are often lower income communities uh, that suffer food gaps worse than others, uh, urban communities in particular. Um, living in New Mexico, I've become more, more uh, aware of the rural uh, aspects of these, the tremendous distance that people have to go to get to a food store, 10, 15, sometimes 50 miles. Um, and these are often, again, lower income. So if we're looking at it in terms of geography, you know, I think we have to kind of look at the, the relationship both to, you know, what, are the, what do the income numbers look like? I also look at what, what, what are some of the racial uh, factors involved. You know, we see these, the, uh, you know, the disparities are much often higher in African American and Hispanic communities than they are in, in white communities. Um, and, um, and the distance oftentimes in rural, in rural communities a function, very much a function of distance, which also relates to, you know, you know, dispersed populations where there's, you know, low, low population density, which makes it difficult often for, say, a supermarket to locate an area where, you know, there's, you know, a county which only has five or 10,000 people. And, you know, and it's a big county. Uh, you're not going to be able to get a full-size supermarket to serve that community. So those are some of the relationships. Were there other, others that you had in mind? Oh, yeah, well, certainly, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've, I've always, t I've, I've, in a democratic administration, I, I find myself taking um, two steps forward, not the 10 steps I'd like to take, but two steps. In a Republican administration, I might take one step forward. And that, I mean, that's not a really uh, strong measure, of course, but I do think that that kind of, I haven't necessarily found that Republican administrations have been adamantly opposed to a lot of our work, um, though in the case of this trans fat issue in Cleveland, you do see a 
definite sort of Tea Party Republican industry kind of alignment at work. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll see, I, I think one th area where you're seeing a lot more action at the policy level and a lot more sort of community level action is in cities. Cities are typically, almost all, not always, but typically controlled by Democratic mayors. That kind of, you, you know, that's happening here in Chicago with Rahm Emanuel. Um, you saw it, you see it in New York with Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, you're seeing in almost every major city, you know, that, that kind of sort of a more progressive thinking about our food system and these disparities and a more sort of progressive action by government around food is beginning to happen. I refer to it as putting food on the public agenda, public policy agenda. The food is now part of what cities do. And that is really being integrated more and more into uh, cities all over the nation. Thank you.